Hi guys. I have received many requests to cover certain cases for this show. I have found a way to accommodate this without playing favorites. At the first of every month, I will sift through names from my list of Patreon donors in a bowl and draw someone at random. That individual will get to choose a case for that month. The link to my Patreon account, once again, is www.patreon, that's spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash leader one L-E-A-D-E-R-O-N-E Thank you and enjoy the show. Are you curious? Do you like hearing the secrets and confessions that people normally keep to themselves reluctant to share with even their most trusted of confidants? At ConfessionPost.com, you can read such sensitive, juicy material. In the Confession Post podcast, myself, Morgan Rector, and my co-host, Lauren Villafania, pour over many of the site's confessions and give our own analyses. It goes a little something like this. So they're looking for used cum to to use for, in gay sex. What, like for lube? Because that's what I would use it for. I can I can understand the element of, of sex and danger. Well, yeah, it's like, like those autoerotic asphyxiation people. But every time I go to the gym, I'm so pissed off at fucking Karen on doing cardio. Looking like she's so happy. They keep talking about this aerobic high, but I, I must have gotten a hold of some bad shit. You can catch episodes of the Confession Post podcast on all your favorite podcast apps, as well as on YouTube. Why do you seem so scared? All I wanted to do was play with you. Please come and play with me. I'm so lonely. You're not afraid of the dark, are you? Don't be afraid. Come with me. I will show you where I play hide and seek. Do you want to play hide and seek? You hide and I'll find you. This episode goes out to this month's Patreon winner, Nancy Reed. This case exposed malfeasance at every level. Not only did the perpetrators commit unspeakable acts of barbarity against the victims, but the conduct of a judge and representatives of the media also faced criticism and, in the case of the judge, a disbarment. Race was a significant factor in the way the crime and the case were perceived, and the debate it fostered was divisive and explosive. However, I will aim to present the case with objectivity and impartiality. Chapter 1. The Players in this Drama The Victims Channon Gale Christian and Hugh Christopher Newsom, Jr., were a young, beautiful, and well-adjusted couple. A prosperous future awaited them. They had been dating for two months, but however still the waters may have appeared to others, they ran very deep. Chris's father, Hugh, quoted his son as saying that of Channon that he loved her. Kara Sowards, a friend of Channon's, told Hugh Sr. that the feelings were mutual. They may have appeared wholesome in disposition and lifestyle while in sight of their parents, but they did like to party hard. Findings of their autopsy reports indicated traces of marijuana and amphetamine in Chris's system. An empty pill bottle bearing a prescription for painkillers was found in Shannon's car where their fate met a pivotal detour. The pills were not prescribed to Shannon, however. One of the defendants alleged during the trial that they were drug addicts on a search for a fix, but a medical examiner disproved this, 
saying that the levels of intoxicating agents in Chris's blood were more typical of a recreational user. Shannon's family moved from Louisiana to Tennessee in 1997. They settled in Farragut, a Tony section of West Knoxville. She majored in sociology at the University of Tennessee. Chris was brought up within the working class environment of North Knoxville. He was a high school graduate and worked as a carpenter. The Perpetrators by all accounts, it was agreed that the ringleader of the cabal who organized and catalyzed the crime in question was Lamericus Deval Davidson. His nickname was Slim. He was 25 years old when the crime was committed. He had just been released from Tennessee State Prison in August 2006 after serving five years for carjacking and aggravated robbery. He rented a house on Chipman Street which is where the most egregious aspects of this crime were carried out in October 2006. He lived there with his girlfriend, Daphne Sutton. They were an interracial couple, with him being African American and her Caucasian. The notion that the crime was racially motivated has been undercut by the presence of a white woman in Slim's life. He also had at least one white friend. Slim's early life was shaped by a mother who was addicted to crack cocaine. She abused and neglected him. He was sentenced to death by lethal injection for the murders of Christian and Newson. His attorneys besmirched the characters and reputations of Shannon and Chris during the trial. This did not go over well with the jury and it undermined the efforts of David's legal representation to obtain a more lenient punishment. David's younger half-brother is named Latalvis Cobbins. He lived in Lebanon, Kentucky. He went by the alias Rome, short for Romeo, said to be inspired by his handsome appearance. He was on vacation in Knoxville with his girlfriend, Vanessa Coleman, and his friend, George Thomas. Latelvis was 24 at the time. He had his own criminal history. He was charged and convicted for an attempted robbery in New York in 2003. While incarcerated awaiting trial, he assaulted a corrections officer. For the Christian Newsom murder, he was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. George Thomas was 24 years old in January 2007. His nicknames were G and Detroit. Vanessa Coleman's aliases were Nessa and Nessie. She was 18. Latelvis, George, and Vanessa were staying at Lamerica's house for the weekend. Daphne stayed at her friend Cassie Suttle's place. Aside from being crowded out, Lamericus was allegedly abusive with her, beating her on occasion. His closest associates have reported that he enjoyed hurting white women. Little did she know that as she made her way to Cassie's place, she was dodging a bullet that would have shot her straight into prison for the rest of her life. Eric Dwayne Boyd, 34 years old, was known as E to his friends. He too had a record. He was convicted in federal court for being an accessory after the fact in this crime by helping Lamericus evade capture. He was sentenced to 18 years for this offense. Prison presented no culture shock to Boyd, who had committed nine armed robberies during a crime spree in 1994. He was convicted for five. The Knoxville grand jury that indicted Davidson, Cobbins, Thomas, and Coleman did not indict Boyd, though many believe he was present during the carjacking and the aftermath his DNA was not detected at the crime scene. The one article of damning evidence was that a car he borrowed was present at the scene at the time the crimes occurred. When this was cited as evidence of his involvement, it proved to be controversial, counting as circumstantial evidence and considered inconclusive by some. Cobbins and Thomas alleged that he was directly involved, but he was not charged at the time. The judge. 
Judge Richard Baumgartner presided over the trials of Davidson, Cobbins, Thomas, and Coleman in 2009 and 2010. He was addicted to prescription painkillers, which led to criminality. It also compromised his ability to remain focused during legal proceedings. He was observed nodding off while reading the jury's verdict in the trial of Vanessa Coleman. He was so high during the sentencing that his secretary, Jennifer Judy, passed him a note, urging him to depart from the bench momentarily to get himself together. He wrote a note back, cursing her in writing. He later claimed to have forgotten that this happened. No longer sober as a judge, as the old analogy goes, he was disbarred. He died soon after, reportedly sober. Chapter 2. The Crime Channon and Chris arranged a rendezvous for the evening of January 6th. They were to meet at an apartment building at 3101 Washington Ridge Way in Knoxville. Shannon's friend Kara Sowards lived there. Shannon drove her silver 2005 Toyota 4Runner there. Sowards left her alone in the apartment. Shannon passed the time using the internet as she awaited Chris's arrival. Part of Chris's plan for the evening was he would pick up his friend Josh and drop him off at the home of a mutual friend, Jamie Hampton, in Halls, Tennessee, where Hampton was celebrating his birthday. From Halls, Chris drove to the Washington Ridge Apartments. He met up with Shannon and parked his truck. Their intentions for the evening was that they would drive to Halls for the birthday party after having dinner. Chris walked around to the passenger side of the truck and kissed Shannon. Just then, a car pulled up containing Lamericus Davidson, Latelvis Cobbins, and Eric Boyd. The car had been borrowed from Eric's cousin, Nicole Mathis. Lamericus brandished a 22 caliber pistol. Shannon and Chris were abducted. Their captors blindfolded them with their hands bound in front. Conjecture by the forensic pathologist led to a theory that Chris was dealt with first so that they could get him out of the picture and have their way with Channon. Chris had been sodomized by one or more of the defendants with some sort of object. It was posited that it may have been a broken chair leg. If it had been jagged and splintered, it would explain why Chris's anus was torn to shreds. After they raped Chris, he was gagged and led with a cloth leash around his neck. He was naked from the waist down. He was taken to the forerunner, where he was driven to some railroad tracks nearby. After walking him a short distance down the tracks, Chris was shot three times, execution style. A sweatshirt was wrapped around his head to obscure his face. The assailants doused him with gasoline and set him on fire. Lamericus, Latalvis, and Eric returned to the house. Lamericus was looking forward to torturing Shannon. He drove around delivering narcotics in her car with her in it. As this went on, Latalvis forced her to perform oral sex on him. He insisted during the trial that she offered to do it in exchange for sparing her life. His DNA was found in her genes, with the implication being that she spat out his ejaculate. Not only did Vanessa Coleman feel no sympathy for her, but she was jealous that Shannon had been the one to give him a blowjob. Throughout the evening into the early morning hours of January 7th, Shannon was raped and beaten. She was anally and vaginally raped with the same object that was used to violate Chris. Lamericus DNA was detected in Shannon's anus and vagina. Did his utmost to avoid leaving incriminating material behind. He washed and scrubbed her mouth and private areas with bleach. After hours of rape and torture, it was decided to execute Shannon. Lamericus grabbed her neck and tried to snuff out her life via strangulation or by breaking her neck. 
He couldn't apply the requisite amount of force, and she remained alive. She was tied into the fetal position with the same cloth that was used as a leash for Chris. Her thighs were pressed up against her chest. Her feet were bound, and her hands were tied behind her back. A plastic bag was tied securely around her neck. They put her in five large garbage bags, one inside of the other. They stuffed her into the trash can in the kitchen, and she was left to die. She was naked from the waist down. The official cause of death was determined to be positional asphyxiation. The following are findings from the report that was submitted by the medical examiner that performed an autopsy on Shannon's body. She was beaten severely about the head. She was violated orally, anally, and vaginally. An object was likely involved in the sexual assault. Her anus and vagina were torn. The assault on her mouth was so extreme the membrane attaching her upper lip to her gums was torn. The pathologist concluded that she died of asphyxiation in the garbage can. Chapter 3. Investigation What has made this case problematic for all individuals involved and affected is that many of the facts that could not be determined throughout the autopsy were clouded by speculation. The perpetrators often contradicted one another, and occasionally, even themselves, while giving statements. Nevertheless, the following data was collected throughout the investigation. Xavier Jenkins, a waste management worker, witnessed four black males depart from the crime scene in Shannon's forerunner the night of the crime. During his testimony, he noted that he also saw an older model car white with red pinstripe, parked outside the house near the forerunner. Nicole confirmed that she lent this car to Eric on Thursday or Friday, the 4th or the 5th, and that she found a plastic bag containing bullets inside the car when he returned it to her. She said she threw the bullets away and that she didn't find his gun. It was never found. Chandon's mother filed a missing persons report with the Knoxville Police Department on Sunday, January 7th. They did not act on it right away since they were adults and it was too early to suspect foul play. 7.45 a.m. Roy Thurman, employee of r and Castings, saw smoke rising at the railroad tracks near Chipman Street. This was Chris's smoldering corpse. John Douglas Ford, an engineer for the Norfolk Southern Railroad, found Chris's remains. He was charred. His features were undistinguishable. Channon's family soldiered on in hopes that she was located. They were not yet informed that Chris was dead. They contacted her cell phone provider to locate where her phone had last been used. Lamericus had allowed her to make a call from the Chipman Street house where the murders occurred. The company pinpointed a location on Cherry Street in East Knoxville, which was close to Chipman Street. Gary Christian and his son Chase found Shannon's forerunner near Lamericus Davidson's house at 1.30 a.m. Monday morning on January 8th. The Kansas Police Department searched the vehicle. They found a bank statement in an envelope. Davidson left his fingerprint on it. Tuesday at about 1.30 p.m., Shannon's body was found in the trash can of the kitchen at 2316 Chipman Street. Eric Boyd makes a statement. The trail to Davidson began at Eric Boyd. Cobbins, Thomas, and Coleman already fled back to home to Kentucky. Once the fingerprint on the bank envelope was determined to be Davidson's, the KPD examined his cell phone records. They found that he had made several calls to Boyd. Police placed Boyd's mother's home in Knoxville under surveillance in collaboration with the United States Marshal's office. The feds got involved because the carjacking, at least in that jurisdiction, was a federal offense. More layers of government piled up on top of this investigation. 
the United States Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of Tennessee, local agents for the U.S. Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, and the Knox County Sheriff's Office. January 11th. Eric Boyd pulled up at his mother's house. His driver's license had been suspended, and he was arrested. From the get-go, he denied awareness of Lamericus Davidson's whereabouts. Under heavier scrutiny, he gave him up. He led law enforcement to 1800 Reynolds Street in Knoxville. It was an abandoned house he and Davidson broke into. Lamericus was taken into custody at 3.35 p.m. that day. His 22 caliber revolver was located and seized. He was wearing Chris Newsom's tennis shoes when he was arrested, even though they were too small. Eric Boyd made two detailed statements that were videotaped, but they have not been made publicly available. According to news reports, Eric claimed to have been barely acquainted with Lamericus, but that he helped him avoid getting arrested for several days. Daphne Sutton provided some assistance to Lamericus. The families of the victims were outraged by the fact that she was not charged for aiding and abetting Davidson. Eric acknowledged that he visited Davidson's house on the day of the crime, but he insisted he only went there to smoke marijuana with him. Sutton told investigators that she saw all of the accused at the house except for Boyd. Vanessa Coleman claimed that he arrived shortly after Coleman's departure. Boyd said that during his visit he was unaware that the murder had happened. He said the only indication that something was amiss was that Davidson said to him that he was in trouble and needed to get out of the area because things were too hot. On the evening of January 7th, Daphne Sutton arranged for Davidson to spend the night at her friend's apartment. She had been staying there. They threw him out on January 9th when they found out about the discovery of Channon's body at the Chipman Street house. After this, Davidson contacted Boyd, who obtained temporary lodgings at the apartment of a female friend of Boyd's. The following night, she threw them out when she found out that Channon's corpse had been found at Chipman Street. Desperate for accommodation, Boyd helped Davidson break into the Reynolds Street house. Eric said that it was only during this time when Lamericus told him about the carjacking, murders, and rapes. Boyd went out for fast food when he was detained by the Kansas Police Department and U.S. Marshals. Boyd was adamant during questioning that he played no role in the crimes for which Davidson was accused. He said he hadn't even been at the Chipman Street house on the night in question. He insisted he only went over on Sunday for a brief visit. He said he borrowed his cousin's car because he was avoiding drug dealers to whom he owed a debt. He told the interrogators that he had alibi witnesses for the night of January 7th. He conceded later that he was most likely walking up and down Main Street of Ridgebrook just drinking, smoking, and drinking and smoking weed. That's all I do every day. I may go to labor ready, temp service, occasionally so I can get a little more buzz money. Despite his claim that he had no involvement in the carjacking, Boyd recounted the offense in question in intricate detail. They weren't able to carjack them, so they ordered them to drive. They just, I guess, a car was coming, pushed them in right in the car because dude was giving girl a kiss. Cobbins told investigators that Boyd was present and witnessed the carjacking. Though Boyd was charged by the feds for hiding Davidson, the Knox County Grand Jury declined to indict him. Lamericus Davidson makes a statement. Lamericus Davidson broke down and cried during his interview. He threw his brother under the bus and denied all involvement. He initially denied any knowledge of the crime. To back this up, he said, I don't even know what the fuck happened in my house, though, man. I don't even know what happened in my house. He said he left the house January 5th and never came back. I hadn't been back to my house since, like, Friday night. I ain't no reason to run if I ain't done shit. I didn't have shit to do with it. I didn't know... I don't know shit about none of that. Only thing I know is what I saw on the news, man. That's what I'm saying. I don't... I don't know them, Shannon and Chris. At all. I don't. 
I had never saw them before in my life. If I did see them in a store or something, I couldn't tell you because I mean shit. The interrogators really leaned on him now, and he could not cope with the pressure. To quote Davidson, Listen, if I tell you what I know, if I tell you everything that I know, exactly how it happened, I'm going to be accessory to the shit regardless, dude. I'm going to be a accessory to it. All this because I knew this shit went on and I knew what happened. Lamericus and Latalvis were both drug dealers. On this visit, like with many, Latalvis was bringing Davidson drugs he picked up from suppliers in Knoxville. On this occasion, Cobbins overstayed his welcome, since Davidson wasn't keen on being in the company of Thomas and Coleman. Davidson said of Coleman, Yeah, but Nesta's not my brother's girlfriend, you feel me? She just somebody he fucking. She not a girlfriend. She, the only reason why she came down here is because she got in trouble with some, she had an assault charge in Kentucky or something. Davidson defended her by saying, I don't think she had nothing to do with shit, man. Davidson was frustrated with Cobbins because he didn't contribute to household expenses while he stayed with him. Davidson put pressure on him to do this, and he suggested he work to earn some money. Davidson commented on this, and the reason why he did is because I told, I mean, I'm on his ass about, man, you gotta do something, my you hear me? You gotta... I mean, he ain't been doing... I mean, not getting no money, you hear me? So you gotta do something. And that's part of why I feel like it's my fault, because I... I pressure that man into going out there and doing some shit like that. You see what I'm saying? Davidson said that on Saturday, his brother showed up with Thomas, Shannon, and Chris in the Forerunner. They came to the house, they already had the car and everything, you hear me? They had both of them in in the back seat tied up. A new girl was at my house. I knew G, Thomas, killed dude, Davidson's oft-used appellation for Chris. I knew they were gonna kill them, you, know, you hear me? Because they, Shannon and Chris, seen everybody. I couldn't be involved in no shit like that, man. And that's basically what I left out. I mean, I knew all this shit was gonna happen. Davidson claimed that he attempted to dissuade his brother from carrying out the carjacking. His brother ignored the warning and left immediately in the forerunner with Boyd, Thomas, and Chris. They returned later without Chris. He asserted that Cobbins said to him that Thomas killed Chris because he was pressured by Cobbins to carry his weight in the operation. Cobbins felt he should do this since it was he who took the lead in the carjacking and kidnapping. To quote Davidson, G did that, referring to Chris's murder. He said he used Lamericus's gun to commit the act. As Davidson said, I'm assuming my gun was used because the pistol, the uh, a bullet, was missing out of it. Lamericus was adamant that only Channon was brought in the house. To quote Davidson, Dude never did come in the house. The girl did, though. He was already gone. Dude was already gone. When they when they left and came back, the only person that was with them was the girl. Took her in the house. Davidson claimed to have interceded on Shannon's behalf. As he put it, they, Cobbins and Thomas, come back. All right, they come back. I ain't ask them shit. I don't want to know shit, you hear me? The only thing I ask them is about what they fitten to do with this girl in my house. He said he knew she was doomed right away. When she was walking in the house, I, I'm asking, wearing a hoodie, no, not tied up or nothing. No nothing on her eyes or nothing. You hear me? So I'm like, what are y'all fitting to do with her? And I mean, I know y'all not fitting to let her go because of how she came in. You see what I'm saying? She came in here with no hood on. I mean, she could see me, see you, see the house, see everything. See what I'm saying? So I know they weren't going to let her go. Davidson said he had a conversation with Shannon after she was brought in the house. She saw me and I talked to her and everything. She just said she ain't want to die, man. That's all she said and she ain't want to die. Yeah, she said she told me she didn't want to die. He said he even tried to comfort her. I told her. I told her that it was going to be all right. 
You hear me? That she... I didn't think my brother was going to kill that girl, man. Or whoever did was going to kill her. You hear me? And my... I put... I put this on my daughter. Man, I told... Girl, I'll make sure she got out. You hear me? I make sure you'll be alright, man. I told my brother, man, and I just... I couldn't take that shit. I left. I left there. That's when I left to go out and serve people I need to serve. He denied having had any kind of sex with Chan and consensual or otherwise. I left the same night the girl, that the girl, when the girl came in the house, I, I mean, I don't give a fuck what y'all say. When that, when that girl was in my house, I wasn't there. And that's all I got to say. But the killing and shit, I didn't, I didn't do nothing. I ain't got nothing to do with it. Too bad for him that traces of his semen were found in her anus and vagina. His lawyers claimed it was a result of consensual vaginal sex and that it was found in her anus due to, quote, seepage, end quote. Davidson contradicted himself at other points of his story. He alleged that mental illness and drug use were the causes of his unreliable recall. See, I ain't on drugs. I mean, I'm not. I don't. I'm a drug addict. I smoke weed constantly, you hear me? I gotta have weed to almost function. And I believe that I'm bipolar too. Like, this is whatever run in my family. But like far as like everything else, the other drugs and shit, I don't do that unless it's there. See what I'm saying? I ain't... I ain't, I, I don't knock nobody for what they do because that's their drug of choice. You see what I'm saying? But I never smoke crack. Never. Because I seen what it done to my mom. But like snorting, snort, snorting, that's what I did all. With all that money, got some powder and some weed and went, went, went at it. Latelvis Cobbins makes a statement. Latelvis Cobbins was arrested on January 11th at the home of Natasha Hayes. Investigators found items that belonged to a Channon at Hayes' home. They also found a notebook being used as a journal by Vanessa Coleman. A handwriting expert confirmed that the text was written in Coleman's cursive. In one of the entries, she wrote, We had a crackhead bring us back. A reference to a woman named Jody Long, who drove three of the defendants back to Kentucky. Latelvis gave his statement the same day he was arrested. He began by saying, You believe I have something to do with this? I ain't got nothing to do with shit, man. I ain't got nothing to do with that shit. Not only did his account of the events differ from that of Lamericus, but his portrayal of their relationship was also dissimilar. He said his brother only visited to replenish his supply of drugs to sell in Lebanon, Kentucky. Latelvis insisted he didn't visit the Chipman Street house during the weekend in question. He also said he argued with his brother over the idea to carry out a carjacking. To quote Cobbins, Me and my brother got to arguing because he said he was going to do some crazy shit. I'm like crazy shit, what he like, man. I'm fixing to go carjack somebody, man. Try and get me some money. He told investigators that he was in the neighborhood to help a friend named Vince move. He claimed Vince set them up with Jody Long as the driver to take them back to Kentucky. Cobbins swore that he only visited briefly on Sunday morning with Thomas to retrieve their belongings. After that, they left. He said that he saw neither Channon nor Chris. He said Lamericus drove them back to Vince's place in the Forerunner. He claimed Lamericus told him the forerunner was on loan from a friend. They stopped at an apartment complex on the way so that Davidson could make a drug deal. Daphne's testimony proved to be the most damning to the defendants. Cobbins had this to say about Daphne and her story. Daphne is lying. Daphne did not come over there on Sunday. He stayed about 15 minutes. I keep telling you... Daphne didn't come over there. Daphne didn't come over there. She say she did, right? But she didn't. She did not see me, and I did not see her. Because after my brother jumped on her, beat her up, she didn't come back. That's what I know. She just wanted his ass caught. I wouldn't be surprised if Daphne didn't have something to do with it. 
One of the interrogators informed Latalvis that Lamerica's landlord reported seeing him at the Chipman Street house when he went to collect the rent. Latalvis's credibility was crumbling. In session two of the interviews, Cobbins said the carjacking was committed by Davidson and Boyd. He claimed that he went along, but without any prior knowledge of what they planned to do. To quote Cobbins, I mean, I had no knowledge that they was going to do that robbery. But at the same time, I'm a fucking idiot, because he was just talking about doing some crazy shit days before. This is his account of what happened once they arrived at the Washington Ride Apartments. They, Shannon and Chris, were, uh, kissing in the car or whatever in the SUV, so run up on, uh, my brother run up on the driver's side, E climbed up on the passenger's side, and I'm sitting in Boyd's car. They forced them in the car, whatever you know what I mean. Then I trailed them back to the house. Cobbins was under the impression that Davidson and Boyd had guns because of the way they gesticulated. He went on, All right, my brother, my brother pushes her over. My brother pushes her over and gets in the driver's seat. But before he gets in, he makes the dude get in the back seat. And so I guess E got in the back seat with him on that side. From there, Shannon was taken by Lamericus from the living room to a rear bedroom. He closed the door. Cobbins described what he remembered about Shannon. Yeah, terrified. She looked terrified. At one point, Boyd went in back and had a whispered exchange with Lamericus. While Shannon was in the bedroom with Lamericus, Cobbins said he heard her weeping and saying, No, no, don't do that. Vanessa Coleman recounted the same thing. Latelvis did not intervene on Shannon's behalf because he feared his brother's retribution. He said, They were crazy, man, that he may try to turn on me or something. He denied participating in the rape, but his DNA was found inside of her. He pleaded guilty to sodomizing her at the trial. Cobbins tried desperately to exonerate himself but he only succeeded in punching more holes in his story. George Thomas makes a statement. Thomas portrayed himself as a harmless and passive pothead throughout his statement. He claimed to know nothing about the murders. He claimed he didn't even know if anybody was in the room with Shannon. He denied any involvement in the rape by saying, I don't know if I could smoke that much weed that I would forget I had sex. He acknowledged seeing Daphne Sutton at the Chipman Street house. He said he didn't see Shannon there on Sunday. He acted surprised that her corpse was found inside. He put on a show of being shocked and surprised when he heard that she was put in the garbage. Vanessa Coleman makes a statement. Coleman was interviewed on the day of her arrest, January 11th. She mostly stonewalled the police. Though she admitted the principal culprits were present or involved, she mostly made a point of denying all involvement. She was offered immunity for testifying against Cobbins, Davidson, Boyd, and Thomas. Federal prosecutors were able to offer her this deal since she was a witness and not a suspect. She agreed to the deal. To keep their most valuable witness safe, she was housed in a Knoxville hotel throughout the proceedings. This new version of the events was markedly different from the denials she presented with at her interview on the day of her arrest. For instance, she said that Cobbins and Davidson stepped outside the house to shoot their guns at midnight to ring in the new year. Thomas did not do this. She said that on the evening of January 6th, the three men left the house as a unit. She got the impression that Eric Boyd was not aware that a carjacking was about to take place. She said when they returned, Cobbins and Thomas entered first, followed by Davidson minutes later with Shannon in tow, blindfolded. Davidson took Shannon into his bedroom and tied her up. After a few minutes, Coleman heard Shannon say, Stop, quit, don't do that. On Davidson leaving the bedroom and approaching Thomas, Coleman said he said he was going to need him to do a favor so he can trust him. Him and G left the house. They took strips to the sheet, sir. They had a blanket that was folded up, sir, and then they had a gas can, sir. She said that when they left, the gas can was full. They returned without it. 
They drove the SUV and returned between 30 minutes to an hour. When they returned, their shirts were stained with blood. They washed and dried them. Davidson completed this chore by saying to Thomas, Well, that's taken care of. Vanessa claimed that at the time, she didn't know to what they were referring. Hours later, in the middle of the night, Boyd came by the house. She didn't see him, but recognized his voice. She was sleeping in the back room. He stayed between 10 and 15 minutes. Vanessa said that on Sunday night, she heard Davidson ask Channon for a password in the bedroom. Immediately following this, he made a call on the cell phone. Sunday afternoon, Vanessa gave Channon some water. Channon was bound, fully dressed, and blindfolded at the time. While Daphne Sutton made a brief visit, Channon was hidden in a bedroom closet. She said everybody but Channon went on a drive in the Forerunner to a store and an apartment complex. As Vanessa put it, Channon was left in the house alone. She was tied up on Lamericus's bed. They returned an hour later. It was at this point when Lamericus shifted gears. Vanessa witnessed him choking Channon. She said G was in the room. Channon was naked from the waist down. Davidson followed up by pouring bleach in her mouth. To quote Vanessa, he then began to tie her into the fetal position. They got garbage bags and covered her up. G and Lamericus. I told him I was going to call the police, and he told me if I called the police, he would kill me. She said she saw Davidson retrieve the garbage can, but claimed not to see Channon stuffed into it. She said she had no idea what happened to her after that. Lamericus gave her Channon's clothing, purse, and shoes. She claimed she didn't know where he got them from. Monday, Lamericus was gone before they got up. They walked to his friend Vince's place and spent Monday night with one of his friends. On Tuesday, Jody Long drove the three men back to Kentucky. There, they spent two nights with Natasha Hayes at her place, until they were arrested on January 11th. They used her computer to track the investigation. Coleman said of G at one point, G said he was very ashamed of himself. He said he should not have done what he did. He said he shot the guy. Latalvis told him he ought to be ashamed of himself. Because of a breach of protocol when documenting Vanessa's testimony, her statement was not admissible in the trials. She was later interviewed by the ATF. She threw Latalvis Cobbins under the bus. To quote Vanessa, Rome told me that they had wrapped the guy up and burned his body. Um, Lamericus made me come into the room and check her pulse. And then he made me leave the room. Um, Rome was in seeing in, oh, what's the word? Um, he was also a part of the killing of the girl. He also held the guy at gunpoint because Lamericus told him to. Um, he said that he was in the designated area while he was holding him at gunpoint. Rome said he was holding the gun at gunpoint in the designated area. We were in the living room on the floor when he was talking. He said that they had wrapped him up and burned him. When he said they... I automatically note it was them three, Lamericus, G, and Rome. She mentioned that after Davidson strangled Shannon, he ordered Vanessa to take her pulse. To quote Vanessa, he, it was after he had choked her and she was laying on the floor. He hollered at me to come in there and check on her pulse. He said that he couldn't tell if she was dead or not. Lamericus grew impatient and frustrated. As Vanessa put it, he yelled at me and made me go back in the other room because he was mad at me because I couldn't get her pulse. She affirmed that Cobbins and Thomas witnessed the strangling. I seen Rome standing there watching, and G was standing on the left side of Lamericus as he was holding the girl this way, in front of the closet, and he was choking her. Vanessa described what they did with Channon's body next. After I went back into the living room, I seen them drag her from the back room into the living room, and then they tied her up in a fetal position. After they drug her into the living room, they made me go back into the back bedroom. The state of Tennessee always wanted to interview Vanessa. She gave a statement on January 31st. She told them the same things. She was also adamant about her lack of involvement, saying, I didn't have any involvement in it, but I didn't have anything to do with it, though. I understand I was there. 
Vanessa said of Lamerica's time alone with Channon that she was pissed off. In other words, she was jealous that Channon was receiving Lamerica's attention. Vanessa insisted she didn't know it was rape, saying, Honest to God, I never heard her scream or nothing. I didn't. I never heard her scream at all. Enter the media. By mid-January, the crime became widely covered in the regional press. It was also widely known that the victims were white and the perpetrators were black. Many inferred that the crimes were racially motivated, but law enforcement denied this. To quote Knox County District Attorney General Randy Nichols, there is absolutely no proof of a hate crime. We know from our investigation that the people charged in this case were friends with white people, socialized with white people, dated white people. So not only is there no evidence of any racial animus, there's evidence to the contrary. The case didn't receive much national coverage. Conservative pundits were quick to draw attention to that fact. Michelle Malkin appeared on Fox News' The O'Reilly Factor and said, This case, an attractive white couple murdered by five black thugs, doesn't fit any political agenda. It's not a useful crime. Reverse the races and just imagine how the national media would cover the story of a young black couple murdered by five white assailants. Many others pointed to the contrast in coverage of the Trayvon Martin case, an incident where an African-American youth was murdered by a neighborhood watch captain named George Zimmerman, though while Zimmerman is not black, he is also not white. The Legal Proceedings January 31st, all 46 counts were directed against the men. The charges consisted of first-degree murder, felony murder, kidnapping, rape, and robbery. The 17 and 18 counts of murder qualified the defendants for the death penalty. Vanessa Coleman faced most of the same charges, but was exempted from the first-degree charge in the case of Chris Newsom. She also wasn't charged with the felony murders of either of the victims. She was also not charged with a carjacking. Though she wasn't present as a witness or participant in the murder of Chris, she was charged as a co-defendant when it came to the sodomy charge. 2007 Eric Boyd was charged with being an accessory to a carjacking that resulted in critical bodily injury to another person. He was charged with misprision of a felony. In 2018, he was indicted on state level with charges of kidnapping, robbery, rape, and murder. Channon's parents, Gary and Dina, attended the trials. No matter how disturbing the details, they were determined to endure it on the path to victory. To quote Dina, We do this for Channon. We've been through the worst. We and the Newsoms have lost our children. We can endure anything. Chris's father, Hugh, gave his own statement. It doesn't take the hurt away for the loss of a great son, but at least there's some consolation that this guy is off the street, and he'll be off the street for a long time, and not be able to hurt anyone else. Mary Newsom described the feeling that overcame her as she awaited the verdict. It was kind of like Christmas morning, like you can't wait. These kids surely didn't deserve anything that happened to them. Lamericus Davidson was sentenced to death by lethal injection. Latalvis Cobbins and George Thomas were sentenced to life in prison without parole. Vanessa Coleman was convicted of assisting in the facilitating of the crimes. She was sentenced to 53 years. Eric Boyd was also sentenced at the federal level for being an accessory to a carjacking. Due to the misconduct of Judge Richard Baumgartner, the state convictions were initially set aside. Retrials were planned for the summer and fall of 2012. The Tennessee State Supreme Court overturned orders for the retrials of Lamericus Davidson and Latalvis Cobbins. Their convictions and sentences remained as originally recommended. The Channon Gale Christian Foundation and the Channon Gale Christian Memorial Golf Tournament were established to outfit one senior in attendance at Farragut High School with a scholarship to attend the University of Tennessee. 
A foundation was formed in tribute to Chris, which holds a memorial baseball tournament at the Halls Community Park. A scholarship is issued in his name once a year to a Halls High School graduating baseball player of exceptional merit. Gary Christian turned to his church to cope with the loss of his son. He began speaking at numerous churches. In spring of 2017, he asked God publicly to relieve him of his anger. Due to lobbying efforts from both families, two new laws were enacted in 2014 in the aftermath of this case. The Chris Newsom Act. This was introduced to eliminate the requirement for a judge's signature on a jury verdict after a unanimous verdict is delivered. The judge is no longer considered the, quote, 13th juror, unquote. If this law had existed during the trials, the retrials would have been avoided. The Channon Christian Act. This limits attorneys and defendants from portraying a victim in a negative light. During the trial, Lamericus Davidson and his attorneys alleged that Channon and Chris went to his house to buy drugs. This caused a great deal of distress to Channon's family. Meanwhile, there were laws that protected the accused, and due to this, the jury was not permitted to learn of Davidson's previous convictions for carjacking. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.